Yep, it's working. So, hello, Tia. Um, yeah, and if you want to pop in, we have two open seats. If you want to share some of your ideas about how do you keep gratitude, sometimes it's hard to keep it even into Black Friday after Thanksgiving. <laughs> you think, oh, I want some sales. I want to, you know, I want to uh, get get some stuff on these Black Friday sales, and immediately we can get plunged into sadly into consumerism and into thinking about what we don't have instead of what we've been just grateful for. Right. And uh, actually in my uh, Thanksgiving reflection, I, I uh, talked about that, you know, of going from, you know, all this wonderful gratitude and family and, you know, into the total consumerism and, uh, you know, not that I'm against consumerism and a capitalistic society, but, yeah, how do we keep that perspective, you know, that we go from a day of being thankful and, uh, you know, wonderful food and family, and then we're pushing and fighting and, uh, you know, for an object. Mm -hmm. So. Yeah, it's a very quick, it's a, such a quick turnaround that you, that you almost wonder, uh, was it empty? Like, and I, I know I, I've not been a person to go out for Black Friday sales pretty much ever. I don't even, I don't remember doing it except when I was a teenager maybe, but um, because I just don't even like mm -hmm. the traffic of the crowds and the whole bit. Of course, I do go shopping for, for Christmas presents and stuff like right. that. But um, it's, I've never really gotten into, I can't wait to find a um, Black Friday sale. However, uh, it's it's still a mentality that you can't help but but be in in the, in the sense of you know you're a, an American and you do feel pressured to buy no matter who you are if you're buying for Christmas because there you are buying for Christmas mm -hmm. and, and you're thinking you know what makes what makes a good gift what do you buy for people that you know people usually have what they need and and you're and you're thinking what you know what's meaningful and thoughtful but people kind of have what they need and right. you know it, it's a struggle you want you want something to be um you know especially too as a parent you're thinking i don't want my kids to be materialistic but but you um you want them to have something to enjoy mm -hmm. you know it, it's it's tough and you, and you want them to be grateful for what they have so um and then they go back to school and, you know, their friends have had mountains of, you know, the, now the thing is the hoverboards and the, uh, you know, I watches that are, the mm -hmm. watches that are $600 and, you know, all these really high ticket items that, you know, my kids are not getting high ticket items. And so I know they're right. coming back and they're like, maybe either lying about what they are. <laughs> they're like, yeah, my parents hate me. <laughs> I don't, I don't know what, I don't know what's happening there. Yeah. Well, and, and that is that balance, you know, I mean, having things in and of itself, I don't think is the problem. Mm -hmm. You know, it's, you know, what we do with them, what is our focus in life? And, you know, and, and I think that's what bothers me on something like a Black Friday that, you know, as I say, I'm not against consumerism and I'm not against the shop owners, you know, making money and any of that. But to me, it's the underlying attitude, you know, so why are we going from being very grateful and thankful uh, on one day and pushing, shoving and, you know, on the next? And, you know, I do wonder what becomes that focus, you know, is it more that sense I have to have? Mm -hmm. Is it a competition sense? Right. You know, it's what what's kind of going through people's minds and, uh you know, one of the things that I, I was thinking of when, you know, we were talking about this topic and looking at, you know, things like, you know, Black Friday and having things that I think over time, the more grateful we can become, I think that lends us to going away from needing those things. You know, the, the things, the materialistic doesn't seem as important anymore with a sense of gratitude yeah. uh so yeah it, you know it sort of puts things in a proper perspective the gratitude sets up sort of a different sort of priority thing where it's not that you're saying um 
that material things are bad. Or, okay, we should all be monks and swear off all people. <laughs> you know, it's not like that's happening. You're, you're saying you're saying that's all fine, but in priorities, you know, in, in the sense of right. not way up here. This is a mo our most important thing. Right. Well, and, and that's the way that you know, at least more recent as I age, it, it becomes more so that thought. But uh, you know, even looking back, uh, you know, scripturally, you know that. You know, when you look at those times, I think even when Jesus is questioned about goods and, and having things, he doesn't necessarily say, you know, to, you know, not have, but it's more, what is your perspective? You know, does the thing take you away from what's really important in life? And if it does, then it's more harmful to our happiness. It's harmful to an inner peace, harmful to a spiritual sense. You know, if that becomes the key. Uh, whereas if the focus is, yes, I have this good, whether it's useful or just something to have, but my focus remains, you know, how do I have a spiritual sense? How do I love other people? How do I take care of the community? Where that is still my viewpoint or perspective and I just happen to have certain things mm -hmm. so for me that's kind of where you know some of the gratitude uh, kind of falls in right now I was I was going to mention this too last year I did this thing um, kind of inspired by the gratitude journal Oprah does want gratitude journal but a lot of people actually do gratitude type journals. Mm -hmm. And for anybody listening who'd like this as a free resource, I put a link in, in the, the notes or I'm not sure what they're called too. But if you also, if you go to sparkmymuse.com, there are also some links in there. Or if you go to noisetrade.com and just search daily sharpening ritual, because the idea is that you just print out a copy for each day mm -hmm. and it, it is a discipline. So it's, it's like a habitual thing. And you could also do the same thing in a journal that like a notebook but i've found that if you make it easier for yourself then you <laughs> you mm -hmm. help any friction points because it's like oh well i have to write all this down but if it's already set up for you it's easier and the idea of just writing down a few things that you're grateful for each day really will change you over a period of even just i've noticed in five days and probably five to ten days probably almost anyone would see a difference especially if you do it in the morning, <clears throat> excuse me, in the morning and at night. Mm -hmm. And it is different because it's the mindfulness, it's the cultivating the awareness. Right. No, I definitely agree with that. And, and I would encourage people to uh, go and find those and download those. Uh, you know, it is, uh, I like how you've made it very simple, very easy with the prompts, mm -hmm. you know, versus just kind of a list of lines and say, all right, what am I grateful for? Write it down. I think the prompts are, are very helpful uh, in doing that. And um, just a quick pause. We have, it looks like, according to my stats, about 10 or so people. So we want to welcome all of you and uh, glad that you're with us. And if anyone wants to join in and talking about, uh, you know, having gratitude and maintaining gratitude, uh, you know, please, um, you know, send us messages or uh, join us. We have two open seats and we'd be... Uh, more than grateful to uh, bring uh, bring people on and, and kind of hear your perspectives on gratitude and how do you get it and keep it. So well, maybe we should, for people who don't know who we are, just really briefly share who we are. Uh, and do you want to jump in, Chris, or do you want me to? Oh, go first. <laughs> so real quickly, my name is Lisa DeLay, and I've been a blogger for a while since about. 2007 ish 2009 on wordpress and right now since april i've done uh, a podcast called spark my muse and that's it's obviously at sparkmymuse.com and on itunes i do uh, usually two times a week i do a release of podcasts and there's all kinds of different stuff going on this friday tomorrow will be something on grief and loss it's a, a really really powerful very powerful um conversation this time with a woman who went through a string of, of really terrible losses and she talks about embracing grief being there for people how do we how do we come alongside someone who's really lost something because it can be very awkward sometimes when you're when you're uh, when you've lost someone or and you don't know how to reach out or someone you know mm -hmm. is going through something and you're not sure what do you say do you say 
it's sometimes hard to know what to say, to you, you know, be, because people process grief in such different ways. So I encourage you, if you're interested in listening, just the podcast, maybe on a commute or in your downtime over the weekend, come by and check it out. And Chris, you can introduce yourself a little bit too. Okay. And uh, yeah, that sounds interesting. I'm going to have to catch that one on, on the grief. Um, but yeah, I'm uh, Chris Shea, and I have a, a website, um, which is a lifesjourneyblog.com, and I've been doing that site for the uh, last maybe three or so years, uh, where I do focus on mindfulness, uh, daily living, um, you know, how to uh, kind of change our perspective on life, how do we find uh, inner peace. Um, by trade, I'm also a counselor. I speak at uh, national conferences, and uh, I really enjoy doing blabs. So uh, glad to have everybody here with us. Good. And I don't know if, if you can hear us out there okay. I know that for some reason I'm getting feedback on Chris's line, and I don't know if, you, hmm. if you're getting any feedback, and it might just be just my setup, and, and I haven't used my phone yet. So <laughs> if you're having any trouble hearing us, just leave messages so we know if you're hearing us okay, because my setup is new <laughs> because I, I'm having computer problems while I'm on my phone for the first time. So if you at all are hearing us poorly, um, just please leave a message and then we'll know if we need to make an, any adjustments. Right. It might very well just be my phone and my kooky setup that I have going on. <laughs> I don't know. You're, you're coming through nice and clear for me. So, cool. so we are good. Yeah. But, uh, like a double reverb or something sometimes. But Oh, great. <laughs> <laughs> um, so what are some of uh, your uh, thoughts on the topic of the you know gratitude I and mean, how do you i know you're talking about you know the uh, sheet that you developed and doing you know kind of that journal every day um how have you found ways to cultivate gratitude well yeah the the one big thing is kind of um i've, I've noticed uh comparison is a really good thing but it can work it can work to like totally make you jealous of other people or it can work to <laughs> to make you feel very grateful for your life you know so comparison is one of those things that if you compare yourself to someone doing worse than you of course you feel very grateful and very you know happy about your life if you if, if you say oh it could be worse i could be living in haiti in a shack <laughs> you know then you feel very grateful for you. obviously if you compare yourself to the Joneses who just bought, you know, Mercedes Benz and put in an in-ground pool and life is going awesome for them. Obviously you can feel envious and jealous, but I, but I've noticed if you can keep for, for myself anyway, that I can say, um, I know that things could be worse and, and things are always worse for someone else. Um, that you can, that I can look around in any direction very easily and know that things are terribly, terribly worse for somebody in very close proximity to me. Um, very, I mean, that, those are just the facts. Mm -hmm. I don't have to wonder if that's true. I know that for sure somebody is really struggling a lot more than I am right now. And I think that that's kind of keeping a perspective like that and not thinking that, um, poor me, my life is horrible and my life is really hard right now. And it might be, but that I'm, <laughs> I don't have any kind of, um, any kind of particular ownership on pain with mm -hmm. anybody else. Um, that that life is um, basically painful. I don't know. I love the Princess Bride. And I, I, love the, I love the quote in there. Life is pain, princess. And anybody who tells you any differently is selling something. So, and I, I kind of feel like that, not in a negative way, but like, come on. Like, that's kind of how it works. And yeah, there's some awesome times in life. And there's some very sweet moments, but life is kind of a series of, of painful moments, and um, and that's kind of how it is. And if if it's different for people, I, I'm really happy for them. But I don't know that it's really if it's really like that. So I think perspective is kind of um, one of the ways that I I kind of keep try to keep a handle on. Mm -hmm. It doesn't mean that I've figured it out. It doesn't mean that I'm grateful every day or anything or every moment. Certainly not. <laughs> Uh, how do you think you learned that? Because, you know, in hearing what you're saying, it, it sounds wonderful. And there'd be a lot of the points where I would, you know, if somebody were sitting with me and wanted to know how to work it, that'd be one of the first things I would talk about is change your perspective, look at life differently, look at your reality different. Uh, a lot of what I write 
is the word perspective. Um, mm -hmm. But to me, perspective is learned. Yeah. How do you think you, you've come to this moment where, yeah, you're saying, okay, I don't do it perfectly, yeah. but you realize that you try it. How do you think you learned to change your perspective and, and, and gratitude? Mm -hmm. I, I think that the thing that really, really helps you learn that for a Adults, for sure, but definitely for kids, is service. Mm -hmm. And that, in, that when you serve people who can't give back to you, and, and you uh, serve people, uh, you give in secret. In, in other words, you give to people who, who can't give back to you, but you also give to people who don't even know that you're giving to them. Uh, so that there isn't any hubris involved in that. Right. Um, there, that's taken out. So there's no like, hey, I'm pretty awesome. <laughs> I'm giving to somebody, you know. Um, so that you actually just get to see a person's circumstance of what it is. Um, the somebody who's underprivileged in, in need, and um, and get to see it for what it is. So going to um, just a, a poor section of your neighborhood or your town or to a third world country that is super eye-opening um, especially if you come i mean obviously blab can be seen in all over the world and so i know that there could be um, non-americans watching um, but especially if you live in the united states there are definitely some very underprivileged and, and poverty stricken areas but once you go to the third world and you see um, open sewers in the streets and things like that and um, people with no access to medical care mm -hmm. um, it's a different kind of it's a different kind of need and so in in terms of service and ministry and things like that that's that's really perspective it's it's kind of experiential perspective i guess you could say right right and and i would agree you know i, I think in my own life that's a lot of where i've noticed uh the perspective shift is you know when I worked a lot of my early uh, years was ministry and it was uh, more working in inner cities, uh, a lot of poverty stricken areas. And um, I've never been to a third world, but uh, I do hear, you know, that poverty here is, you can't compare it <laughs> to third world poverty. Um, but I, I know what I found in, in a lot of people who were you know, living poorly in, in, in areas where there'd be a lot of crime and a lot of need and, and not many resources. In a lot of ways, they were some of the more at peace people that I'd ever met. Uh, you know, some of the more deeply spiritual people that I'd ever met. And it's not to say that, you know, they were like enjoying their poverty. I mean, they were definitely suffering in, in you know, their own ways, but I think because they had less when they worked on shifting that perspective, then they understood what little they have is, is so very important to them where when we gain so much, you know, I, I think we begin to lose that perspective. And I know I learned a lot of, about gratitude by working with them, you know, that, I walked in there thinking, you know, that I'm going to give them something and, you know, what am I going to share with them? It was all me, 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 you know, like here's the great person walking in, you know, but what I found was, you know, it, it was more sitting with them and listening and learning their stories and their lives and just seeing, uh, you know, that peacefulness and seeing that spirituality and, and have them talk about gratitude. You know, they, they'd always talk about, you know, well, I'm grateful you're here. I'm grateful, you know, to have this meal. I'm grateful. You know, when was the last time we sat down and said to somebody, you know, I'm really grateful you're sitting with me and having this talk. Yeah. yeah. But I used to get that all the time. Yeah. I think that's the thing. I had a fascinating and, um, and very insightful talk on my podcast with Shane Claiborne. If, are you familiar with Shane from The Simple Way in Philadelphia? Mm -hmm. No, I'll have to check out that podcast. Yeah, he's a social activist, and he's done a lot. So his community is an intentional community that moved into Kensington, Philadelphia, in the poorest area of Philadelphia. And what they did a little at a time was they bought a house, and then they, they moved in, and people could move in who needed a, a place to live. Mm -hmm. Little by little, they've been kind of um, – I think there were – 
27,000 abandoned homes in the area <laughs> um, and just a ton of factories, ton of people out of work, um, all this blight. And they've put in gardens and they have just tried to reclaim the area a little at a time. And what he said is that because people need each other, there's a whole different kind of interdependence mm -hmm. in the community that you don't get in affluent areas where people are isolated in a moment and independent. It's just a, just a really great lesson about that affluence can make you very uh, independent and lonely. And mm -hmm. That in, in more areas that where there's more need, there are close relationships because people need each other because they have to they have to have each other right? Right. and they have to, they have to depend on each other. And so um, it's just a great, it's just a really great perspective. And so that's how it is in typically in poorer countries as well. So they're, they don't have um, the luxury of not working together. You know, they, <laughs> and, and the same is true in like in, in other countries where there's, where there's a lot less, it, the churches are the same way too. So when, when people come together, they might, each bring a, like a cup of rice and they all put it in a pile. And then people who don't have food for that week or that day will come and they'll take what they need and they'll go back to their homes and they'll eat that day or that week. And that's because you give out of what little you have for the people who really don't have any. And that's this, just the way people get by. And so that, you know, in, in other areas where you have plenty, you don't even think that you don't even think that you might need somebody else. Right. So anyway, it's it's just like it's just a fascinating way to think. You know, not everybody lives um, you know, where they really need their neighbors. And so um the idea about putting yourself in a position where you're gonna need your neighbor, where you're gonna have to need them mm -hmm. is is just like, oh, you know, maybe maybe our block only needs one or two lawnmowers. Right. You know, maybe our block only needs one or two snow throwers mm -hmm. and, and kind of those ideas that maybe we don't have to do it this way. Maybe maybe we could have a couple things in common or maybe we could maybe we could do things a little bit differently where we actually really do need each other. And, you know, and so, um, yeah, it's very it's very eye opening. Yeah. And that makes you that makes you have gratitude for the actual relationships. And, and I totally agree. And, and I, I think when I reflect on society and, and our American culture, and, and especially, I think, you know, an upper middle class and higher, we do lose that in our neighborhoods. And when I was working in the cities, you know, that's one thing that I would notice that, you know, we tend to have lost the sense of the neighborhood when people don't know their neighbors anymore that changes things or if there's a tragedy all of a sudden everybody's knows each other and, and even if it's just to come out and talk and i, I still remember when uh, the attack of 9 11 had happened and yeah. you know i was not in new york at the time and none of that but in our neighborhood um everybody was outside just talking amongst each other but it was interesting that you hear the news, you watch what's going on, but then that, you know, sense was, and, and like nobody announced it, there was just a sense, let's all walk outside. Let's find what other people are talking about. And there really was no reason. Exactly. There was no reason for us to go outside. We weren't in any danger. There was nothing going on. But you start to notice people gather. You know, we get a big snowstorm and all of a sudden people aren't just shoveling their driveways and all. They're saying, hey, do you need a hand? Do you need this? But any other time during the year, I have no idea who this person is. I don't see this person. Yeah. So I, I agree with what you're saying in, in that sense that, you know, I think if we worked together more, we would have that sense of gratitude more, you know, that, that we would feel um that said that we belong it's not just us um mm -hmm. i know one of the things in a lot of my counseling work uh, especially previous counseling work was with uh substance addiction yeah. uh, drugs alcohol and what, a lot of times i would hear from people when i would suggest well what about going to aa meetings or what about finding you know a group to uh, help you out and a lot of guys would say, nah, I don't, I don't need the group. 
Uh, you know, I drink alone, so I don't read other people. Yeah. <laughs> so, you know, I'd sit there and say, all right, you physically drank alone, and you're saying so you can recover alone. I said, but did you ever think, though, when you were drinking that alcohol, did you actually make that alcohol? Or did you have to go buy that alcohol? Because if you had to go buy the alcohol, then you needed somebody to own a store. Mm -hmm. And you needed somebody to make that alcohol. And you needed somebody to make the bottles to put in the alcohol. And somebody makes the labels. And somebody had to deliver it. And somebody, you know, the point being that, sure, you physically drank that alcohol by yourself. But without a community, you would have never been able to drink that alcohol. And I think in, in that same sense, you know, if, if what I'd be saying to them, you know, if, if you want to, you know, work on a recovery, you're going to need other people. But I, I think that's true for all of us that, you know, how do we begin to shift that perspective and understand that even if I want to be alone or even if I want to kind of do my own thing, if you're sharing any resource, you're already working with a community. You know, so it, I think it'd be very difficult to actually go off by yourself and say, I don't need anybody at all. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And when it's when we kind of get into trouble uh, that we look around and we're like, oh, wow, I'm really disconnected now. Who am I going to turn to? You know, or even just for the simple things like um, uh, somebody I know uh, as an acquaintance. Um, you know, it's just, just very, very independent. And then hadn't heard from in a while was like, Hey, I'm going away. Can you watch my animal, you know, for, a, you know, pet sitting or whatever. And I was like, yeah, sure. But I know that in every other way, except for this one teensy tiny <laughs> way, <laughs> I need outside help. You know, I was going to be completely excited to be very, very independent, but this one tiny little thing, like, it doesn't actually have to be that way, but but I think the whole goal of this person's life was like, I don't need anybody. And right. I was like, but that's not, that actually isn't the goal. Maybe it would be nice to, to need somebody. Maybe, maybe it would be nice to, um, in a way you don't need, yeah, you don't need anybody, but maybe you could put yourself in a position that, because if you really don't need anybody, then nobody's going to ask you for anything either. You know, right. Like if you're, if, if you don't ever, because it, it really is a give and take. So, mm -hmm. you know, like, if you're, if you're super independent, you never ask anybody for anything, then no one is ever going to ask you because the door hasn't, has to go both ways. You know, you can't be like, oh, I'm a, like, I'm a rock and nobody, <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, it, it mm -hmm. has to go, it's mutual. Mm -hmm. So, you know, it was kind of like these little emergency situations that make you feel vulnerable where you oh, I have to ask for help. I hate asking for help. It's, it's like, how about just ask for help when you actually don't hundred percent need it so that a person might ask you for help sometimes and not right. like they're a jerk for doing it. Right. You know, and, and it's just kind of like, and, and I thought about, I wonder if she felt bad asking me for help because, you know, like I was wondering, did I make it easy for her to ask me? So, so like it, it made me think, am I asking for help enough too? So, mm -hmm. so it's, it's kind of like, the, that's a, that's an important thing to be in terms of gratitude. Are we grateful for the people in our lives, but are we making it easy for them to be grateful for us? In that right. Virtuality of, of um, being vulnerable, being able to give and take. So it, people are going to be grateful for us, but only if we've made it easy for them to ask of us and, mm -hmm. and have that back and forth. Exactly. You know, and, and that's one of the things that I really like about cultivating a sense of gratitude, that gratitude, I think, is one of the rare uh, emotions or, or senses that I can have that are both internal and external. In, in that sense, you know, I can be grateful for the things that I have for the people in my life, but gratitude is also, as you're mentioning, you know, how do I share some of this gratitude? or help other people. So when I do service, when, when I do something small for someone, we're sharing a sense of a gratitude and possibly even having a return of a gratitude. So I think where it becomes, you know, how do I necessarily know how to cultivate a gratitude 
if I don't allow people to help me and therefore be grateful for the people who helped me. Hmm. Yeah. You know, I, I would have no reference for that. I, I So I could maybe have the internal gratitudes, but I, I don't have that external because I'm not even asking for it. We're missing half of the uh, whole piece here. To me, it's it's the whole. It's it's the the feeling that I have for what I have, and it's also the action. Uh, you know that I can either do to help somebody, or the action of asking somebody to do for me. Uh, it, it goes both ways, and and I think it's it's rare in, in emotions that it, it's cultivated both ways, internally and externally. You know, one of the things, Chris, that I was I was just thinking about too is that um, I have to stay off Facebook a lot lately because. There's been obviously some terrible tragedies that have happened recently. Mm -hmm. uh, our world lately is is just rife with them, and there's a lot of horrible things. Obviously, I'm not trying to put my head in the sand, but at the same time, I have to really limit my intake of current events and news to, to headlines, and because getting overly involved isn't isn't good for me. I need to be more like with my neighbors and in my community. Than mm -hmm into world events but i have also noticed beyond that is the amount of complaining seems inversely proportionate to the amount of gratitude very and much so something to do with current events because some people can say this happened and this happened so let's complain about xyz you know <laughs> let's say, right. let's you know these things happen let's complain about all these things but also just complaints in general there's I don't know if you've noticed. <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, I have not stayed off as well as you have. <laughs> <laughs> and um, the complaining and the gratitude seems like if you're going to be complaining a lot, I'm thinking the gratitude isn't is absent. And, and that's what I'm wondering. It would be really cool if there was and maybe there is the data out there. I don't I don't know about it. But um, I think for my own life, if I'm just looking at myself, and spitballing that I think that it has to be really, really connected that if, mm -hmm. if I'm thinking, if I'm thinking honestly in my own life, the days that I'm complaining and I feel um, that complaints are easy to come by, I bet that those are the days that the gratitude is really waning and, <laughs> and on right. towards the E, <laughs> towards <laughs> e and empty, you know, um, and I, I have a feeling that's that's probably connected. And do you see a corollary there for for you, or for, in just in general? I, I would definitely for both ways, you know, uh, for myself and and in general. And as I mentioned, I, I don't have the discipline you have that uh, can stay off of Facebook or the social media. I'm I'm there, and uh, um, it, it does affect me because what really bothers me. And also challenges me, but what really bothers me is what you're saying that, you know, everybody wants to complain and blame. And as soon as something happens negative in the world or, or evil in the world pops up, it seems that the majority of people want to put that blame out and complain about it. I don't see how we can have a sense of gratitude, of a thankfulness, while at the same time complaining and blaming. For me, when we look again at the gratitude of the internal, the external, I think these are the times when all the negatives are happening in the world and the, the evil seems to outweigh the, the good. What if we spend that time to reflect on what is good in my life? What am I grateful for at the moment? And in what I'm grateful for, do I have an ability to share that gratefulness? Mm. You know, one of the things that I think is that challenge, and, and I've written a few times uh, on this topic, that you know, I think when we get so stuck in the world events and so stuck in the negative of it, when we look at ourselves as the victims of it, and the victim meaning there's nothing I can do about it, you know, so the world events are going to happen. I can't change it. Um, you know, I'm not a politician. I'm not policymakers. I can't do this. But I think in, in what you said is key. Do we focus on our world in the sense of what is my personal world? 
you know, what is my family world, my work world, my neighborhood world? What can I do positive to affect good in that world? And I, I don't mean it in a selfish way because I'm not saying my world as far as me. It is that extended world, but yeah, I'm not going to be able to by myself affect change in the Middle East or Paris or San Bernardino. I can't do that. But instead of feeling the victim and complain and blame, what around me in my neighborhoods and my work and my family, what can I do that's positive? And, and I think if we focus there, we would get more of that sense of a gratitude because we would see that I am doing some good. And it doesn't have to be huge. You know, it, it could just be waving at the neighbor instead of ignoring the neighbor. You know, something small like that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But that's going to help to give that sense of, of the gratitude and hopefully eliminate the sense of, you know, I'm a victim to the world. Right. That may be true, but I'm not a victim to my neighborhood, you know, to my community. Right. And uh, how do we shift that perspective? Yeah. And there, there's a lot of... There's a lot of, um, I just thought that the hysteria would, like, how much, the, the headlines are just more hysteria than more hysteria. And I'm like, how mm -hmm. is the ceiling on the hysteria? And not that people shouldn't be upset. It's upsetting. Oh, <laughs> this, this definitely. It's upsetting. And I understand, and, and the pain is real and it's horrible. But then it's like this headline. Oh, now we're upset about this headline. Now we're upset. And, and it's like. We're, we're upset about headlines like there's a real pain going on and mm -hmm. um i i think that it's it's kind of like i feel like i need to get the volume on the media how it's being how it's being done and we're right. gonna crank that down <laughs> at least yeah. at least in my life i got i'm i'm cr taking, taking the media outlets because i think the only thing that works now to get to get attention is let's make it more let's make people so angry and so upset that they're going to pay attention to what we're saying. Right. And it, it works really, really well, but it's not helping anybody heal from mm -hmm. the tragedy they're suffering. And so I can't help anybody in that far away place, but I can build bridges in, in the little tiny world that I live in, in, in my little neighborhood or my, the podcast guests and people that I interact mm -hmm. with in my, in my tiny, in my tiny way. And that's kind of it. <laughs> yeah. Speaking about the, I have a, a, I was telling you, I have Jennifer Michael Hecht coming on on mm -hmm. November 18th. She's a poet and an atheist philosopher and a historian. Right. And she talks about wonder. She's, she's writing a book called Wonder Paradox. And she goes into a, a riff that's this beautiful riff about wonder and our, our universe and our universe waking up to to look at itself it was it's just this really cool rift and it and and you're kind of like oh yeah we do there's a lot of pain but we do live in a wonderful place and the fact mm -hmm. that we can even that we can even be conscious of it right it's it, it does blow your mind it, it is amazing and life is amazing even though it's painful and even though people do terrible things and there is grief and pain Mm -hmm. We still get a lot of, there is still a lot of chance at experiencing beauty right. and, and joining with other people in, in good projects and good things. And so there are still chances. <laughs> there are still oh, yeah. chances for redemption and beauty. And we can't lose hope when these, when these events happen and when people sort of bait, bait us into like, hey, come here and be hopeless with me, you know, or mm -hmm. hey, let's think this is, let's think this stuff about violence will never be that fixed, right? Right. Um, and I think that, um, you know, the, the temptation is to think that things are never going to get better. And um, I'm just not going to be a part of that propaganda, I guess. Right. And, and, and I totally agree in that. And for me, you know, when you look at all of this, it, it goes into having reasonable expectations. Mm -hmm. You know, that if my expectations of my abilities are reasonable, um, and I'm not saying not to challenge ourselves, but 
even in challenging myself, is this still a reasonable expectation as to what I can do? And, uh, you know, move with that. But I, I, I think, and again, I don't have the answers. I mean, it'd be great if somebody joined in with an answer. <laughs> if there is even an answer, but you know, I think it, it's definitely easier to be a victim, to complain, where it's a lot more difficult when we have to do some inner reflection on what am I grateful for mm -hmm. and really do that inner reflection to find the beauty you know, in the world. Uh, it's so much easier to join that bandwagon. And, and I think the news media is doing it, uh, I think, mainly for the ratings. That, that's where, you know, if I'm more sensational, they'll watch me because I'm more sensational. But I do wonder if part of being sensational on this is what helps people in an unhealthy way, in my opinion, to cope with this. Because the more that we can talk about the sensational headline and the more that we can talk about, um, you know, blaming others or, or blaming, you know, the, the uh, guns or politics or what we're doing is not focusing on the hurt and the pain. You know, when you look at that, you know, the San Bernardino, you know, last I heard like 14, you know, dead. And, you know, you think about the impact that 14 people who are no longer with us, you know, the impact it has on their immediate families, on their friends, on the friends of friends. And, you know, there's a lot of people grieving this. But when you look at the headlines, you don't have a headline that talks about how do we cope with grieving? How do we help families cope with grieving? Right. You have the sensational headlines of the politics and the policies and, yeah. um, you know, create more of the fear. And I think that's where we're losing that sense of, of that gratitude, you know, that but people don't want to deal with the pain and the suffering of the reality of what's going on. They'd rather complain about the policies and the politics, which sure we may have to fix policies and politics. I'm not saying that we don't, but we can't ignore that these actions, apart from politics, has real impact on real people with real feelings, and yeah, right. it's just easier for us to ignore that. Yeah, it's it's easier to say, you know what what laws should be changed but it's like how about these families just lost people just before christmas <laughs> like you know these people right. are, died just before christmas time and they're gonna have these holiday meals with people gone and right. now what you know i mean it's it's because that's really hard to wrap your brain around and you don't know how to approach that's way harder to approach than say hey, how about we pass this law that says this thing? Because that's so concrete and it's so, mm -hmm. you know, defined. Like, oh, wouldn't that make everything better? And it's a nice, neat bow, you know? <laughs> but grief what? is so messy. And mm -hmm. it's so messy that it's it's like, you know, that that's that's hard. That's hard to deal right. with. Um, you know, people... People just got slammed around, you know, families just lost people in, in a really destructive, really violent way. And a whole community is just in agony. Mm -hmm. and right. Like, and, and how about we, how about we tidy this up real quick? <laughs> exactly. So, you know, change this and then, you know, we're, we're good or complain about so-and-so or blame so-and-so because then I don't have to feel. But, but I think part of it you know, does come into that whole thing about what are our reasonable expectations and can we redefine our world to the world in which we actually live, you know, our community, our neighborhood, our family, our work. Because I, I think part of the reason we don't want to deal with the grief of all of this is it becomes too overwhelming, as, as you say, if we just watch the news, you know, life might not even be worth living if you watch what's going on around the world. But if we focus in our areas, the, the areas that we actually have influence over, we can cope with that. 
you know, can I, I cope better with a tragedy within my neighborhood than the multiple, multiple tragedies that I hear about around the world? And I agree with you, it's not sticking our head in the sand, but it's saying, you know, I have my world that I, I can work within. Let me work within my world. Let me fix my world. But the more, you know, we're focused on all this other stuff, and I wish I could remember the exact quote, but in one of his books, C.S. Lewis wrote about uh, that, and, and obviously he wasn't even alive in this age of 24-hour news cycles and texting and Twitter. And, but part of what he was writing about is he did lament that the fact that you hear about worldwide tragedy, he thought was hurting people and hurting their spiritual sense uh, because it is overwhelming. And, uh, you know, I thought he really had a good, you know, key uh, on that. Yeah, he actually, we, we just bought a, my husband and I bought a, um, a, a thing that was recently done about mere Christianity, and it's a video series, and, and it talks about, and that was um, from the BBC, BBC addresses that were done on the radio mm -hmm. right around World War II, right just after World War II, and he in the series it talks about how he didn't know at the time he didn't know who like the um who was in charge in greece at the time he didn't know who i don't know if it was a president of greece or who however that was set up and he didn't pay that much attention to politics and that much attention to world affairs um because he didn't feel that those concerns were that it was that important to be that concerned with all world affairs right um, for, for just exactly why you're saying, because um, being, because there's nothing you can do about so many different world affairs. You kind of have to pick the thing that you're going to be mm -hmm. doing and do it well. And it's it's not like saying, you know, oh, I don't care about social justice and you know, right. I don't care. It's not like saying, oh, I don't care that they're starving people in, you know, pick your place. Right. It's not saying that you don't care, but it's like saying, I know that I do care, but I can't. I'm going to pick the thing that I can do well, and I'm going to sink my money and my time and my efforts, and I'm going to let some other some other people handle the other things. Right. Yeah, I mean, you know, look around your your local community. You know, what are the needs of your local community? And you know, as people want to focus on you know these hot spots around the world, and and as you say, I mean, it's not that I'm going to ignore that, but we may have similar issues going on in our own community. How is it that we forego those issues for the world issues? You know, because we can't do everything. I mean, if we could do everything, well, that that's totally different. But we can't. And, uh, you know, that's where over the years I've begun to learn, and, and I think it's part of that gratitude, but looking at those expectations and say, what reasonably can I do? And uh, one of the uh, going into scripture is that always struck me um, because I always wanted to help everybody. That was the key. Like, I'm going to help everyone. Well, you can't do that. <laughs> that, that was the idealistic college kid. It was, you know. Um, sure. But I remember the time that, that Jesus goes to, you know, the, uh, the well where there's many, many people who needed healing at, at the waters. And he walks through the crowd. It's not even grabbing somebody at the end of it. He walks through the crowd, heals the one person in the front, walks through the crowd again to leave. And, you know, that kind of struck me that all he had to do was, like, wave his hand or something. They'd all be healed. You know, he didn't have to walk past everybody <laughs> to get that one person and walk past everybody again. But I, I think that's part of that lesson that, you know, you can only do what you can do. And, you know, there's always going to be people who are suffering, always people in need. But at the same time, there's always people who can help those people in need. But nobody says that one person can help everyone in need. So, you know, how do we focus on who do we help, who can we help, and pray and hope that people in other areas have similar people who can help them? Uh, you know, but for me, one of the lessons I took from that uh, scripture was that perspective. 
you know, we can only do what we can do. And for whatever reason, he chose to only do what he could do. So. Yeah, and I, I think, too, like, if you, if you think about it, if you are, for instance, if you're on Facebook and you're on Twitter and you're spending two or three hours a day, for instance, getting very upset and using, you know, until your thumbs get sore <laughs> or whatever, right? And you're like, that sucks, blah, 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 blah. And, Imagine the two or three hours if you just went into your neighborhood until you found someone who needed help, mm -hmm. help them with something just for that same two or three hours or just found somebody who needed your help close to you or in your family and just use the same two or three hours in that day yep. close by. There's somebody who needs you and that and that all that anger and pent up frustration that we spend hurling out these tweets into the universe or wherever they go <laughs> that don't do a darn thing mm -hmm. like said, you know like, oh my gosh how could they say that they're horrible no one cares what you're saying no, one, no one's listening <laughs> you know no one's listening to your tweets and um and it's it's really it really is like we i think we gotta we gotta um kind of get we kind of gotta wake up a little bit yeah. and it's not like we we are allowed of course to to send out our tweets into the universe and we're allowed to have our expressions and you know i've done right. it i've done it too i'm not you know um, I, I love good political debate on social media <laughs> you know, we get sucked in we get sucked in but it's but it's like a honey trap you know and i yeah. think that we we um we do waste our time with things that don't matter and and being upset, you know, I, I know there's there's different social causes that are out there and they get their hashtags and they um, generate a lot of heat and a lot of response. And sometimes sometimes it's worth it, but most times it probably isn't. And our little jab that we get to stick in there and the little the little flames that go up in uh, back and forth on they really in the end in the right. weeks, no one even cares. No one knows what you said. No one mm -hmm. cares. And, and I think that all that time and energy that, that we're spending in our in our very clever, our, our very clever ideas and words out there, I, I wish that I wish that we could find a way to to harness that energy in some other direction that had concrete yeah. something right in right in our neighborhood. And maybe maybe it's just that we all have to kind of do it at the same time, <laughs> make a right. pact, make a pledge. <laughs> And, and figure it out. But I think I think the time's coming that people are going to finally say, you know what, enough is enough. I, mm -hmm. I realize I realize I've been doing it wrong, and I realize I'm I'm not helping. I'm only I'm only contributing to the hysteria, and I'm right. only contributing to to the noise. Right. Well, and, and I think one of the things that I find interesting is, you know, if you watch any of the movies about. Uh, you know, apocalypses of, of any type, you know, and, and you see the aftermath. You know, what do we typically see in any of these movies is whatever the apocalypse happens to be, the aftermath is always a group of people who are helping each other out to survive. And, you know, again, it's that focus of that community, and, and we are community people. And if we can maintain that community focus, over time, we are going to change the larger world, but we're going to be doing it one person, one community, or one neighborhood at a time. But I believe, and maybe this is the old college kid talking again, but I do believe that we can change that. But it's not in the way that uh, I think most people are trying to do. And, and you're right. You know, we, we lose a sense of gratitude because then we fall into more of a despair. You know, well, I try to do good and see the world is still falling apart. So, you know, what, what does this matter? Um, you know, but do you know your next door neighbor who might need you to take them to a doctor or, or something like that? And, and or just sit with them and listen to their stories, you know, and and they might be grateful that you listened because nobody stops by to listen to them. Um, you know, yeah, that doesn't stop gun violence, but that makes a difference in that person's life. And, and I think what you can take out of that is they had a sense of gratitude in the sense that I belong and somebody cared and you can walk away feeling good about yourself, which might encourage you to do more good. 
And, and I think what we find is the more good that we do and the more you get that sense of an external gratitude, you end up becoming more spiritual. And, and to me, it's, it's this full circle, you know, that if I end up being more spiritual and more grateful to a higher power and, and, and my God, my God out of love is going to tell me to do more work. And it just becomes the circle, but notice that difference in the circle. The circle now is I'm helping other people, I'm growing spiritually, I'm helping other people growing, versus, yeah, the tirades on the social media, the woe is me, the world is falling apart. Yeah. We can have that out of that sense of gratitude, I think. Maybe I'm too naive, I hope not. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think... You know, kind of deciding what are my values and what would a what would a win look like? A win in the sense of like what would be a meaningful week or day? What would be a meaningful month? Like it doesn't it doesn't have to be a big thing. A meaningful a meaningful week could be like I had you know three um, important discussions with people this week. You know, I mean, you couldn't, and that's part of um, you that's part of actually the resource that I have that it helps you kind of right. plan that out or just because what can happen is by the end of the week, you don't even remember all the stuff you were plinking out on social media or, or whatever. You don't even, you don't remember any of that stuff. No, it, it disappeared somewhere. It just goes away. You're not going to like go through it later. What was in my Twitter feed? You're not really going to go through it, but if no. you have it in a journal or, or somewhere, you can say, you know, what would a win look like mm -hmm. later this week? Okay, if I had a, a meaningful conversation with someone I care about, or if I um, added something to somebody's life, if I, it doesn't even, usually it's not a big thing. If I did a random act of kindness, you know, people have said so many times, someone did a random act of kindness, they bought me a cup of coffee. That was like two, a two or three dollar thing yeah. at McDonald's. And people, it will change someone's whole day. They're like, I can't believe someone did that for me. Mm -hmm. So tiny. And yet it can change someone's whole day. Mm -hmm. And it's those little things that feel like huge, huge wins. And yeah, it won't stop people from getting mass murdered. It probably won't. But it will make your, your week maybe hugely more meaningful and much richer. And then at the end of the week, you're like, I do have more gratitude because I decided my week was going to look this way. Right. And I decided ahead of time how I wanted it to go. Yep. I don't know. I, I don't know. I mean, planning planning your week. I'm not a big planner, but I have noticed that if I keep track of things in a mm -hmm. kind of way, it's a it's a habit. Of, it's a discipline. If I do that at all, it's a total upgrade. Yeah. <laughs> no, I, and, and I really like what you're saying in that small act of, of that kindness, because, you know, if you know of anybody who had a small act of kindness done to them, they're usually bragging about that all day long, you know, to whoever they meet, you know, can you imagine somebody bought me this or somebody did this or, you know, this stranger did, that's all they're talking about. And, and that's great because now we're not complaining, but we're sharing this sense of gratitude. Yeah. But doesn't that kind of become infectious? You know, as you're going around, say, your office place or wherever you are and saying, you know, I can't believe this person did this. And everybody else is like, hey, that's wonderful. Well, they're sharing in that sense of gratitude, mm -hmm. you know, and you've created in, in this micro world these people who are feeling happy and at peace and, and a sense of gratitude that they would not have felt had a person not spent the two bucks on a cup of coffee. And you may have no idea what you did. You you might have been like, oh, okay, you know, you're short or whatever. I'll I'll give you the two bucks, and you walk away and might forget about that you did it. But you just changed this person's day, and you changed their office day, <laughs> and you impacted all these other people. Yeah, you don't know that. Yeah, and and most of the time, like I've been in the grocery store, and people have done it for me too. I I, I will have something. There's one little produce store they only take cash you know I'll, I'll have i won't have had enough or someone will say you know i'll say oh okay can't, can't get the bananas and they'll just say just just get them it's no yeah. deal it's it's two dollars or whatever it's, it's three dollars whatever it is and and i'll be like wow and and i've done that mm -hmm. with people too and they will like look at me almost cry and then i'll be like that is the cheapest 
uh, like big thrill you can ever have. Mm-hmm. It's these tiny, usually they're tiny and usually they're, but, but it's like the surprise. And so that'll be your homework for anybody still listening. Anybody hang mm-hmm. on a couple of you. We, we have, it looks like over 14 people. So <laughs> yeah, that'll be your homework for, for the rest, sometime the rest of this week, something under $5 surprise somebody with, uh, do some ra- random act of kindness. It could be $5 or less. Mm-hmm. Just do. It doesn't even have to cost anything. Just do something really kind that someone's not expecting, and uh, see what it does. See if it see if it brings joy in somebody's life. Usually, it uh, has an incredible benefit. You you wouldn't, uh, and it can be kind of addicting because you can. Be, mm-hmm. This is awesome. This is really fun, and uh, it is. I think it is infectious because I think it does something yeah. for our soul, and I think it connects us on some other level right. that usually we're. It's it's weird that we don't do it more for how good it feels. It has a almost like mm-hmm. a drug like effect on. Usually. Well, like, and and I think it comes back to perspective. You know, like why don't we do it more? Because we think, well, what did that two dollar cup of coffee do? You know, yeah. In, in that sense, if I have the right perspective, it's infectious, and it's like I want to keep doing this, and you know, maybe I'll do this weekly, maybe I'll do this. But but I think for you know a lot of people, they're saying, well, what what is that doing? You know, what, what so I pay for their coffee, pay for their bananas. I, you know, what, what is this? But again, you know, how that spreads, you know, I mean, looking at the stats, you know, we got about 15 people, give or take, you know, right now on, on this. Well, if, if all of us did something to somebody else, that's at least 30 people who are now just infected with some gratitude. And those other 15 that were just shared with are going to share with other people. And I'm not a mathematician, so I'm not going to keep extrapolating. <laughs> 15 plus 15 is good enough for me. <laughs> but, but yeah, but think about that. That $2 cup of coffee, that if each of us did that tomorrow, affects 30 people. Mm-hmm. But it's affecting more than those 30 people who got that cup of coffee. It's affecting all the people they interact with and say, I can't believe somebody... I mean, in theory, and again, I don't think it's my naivete, in theory, we can be affecting over 100 people just tomorrow. It could be, yeah, it could be, yeah. And it, and it, and it doesn't even have to be buying something for somebody. It could just, yeah. it could just be some other thing. And I think it, it is, um, yeah, we'll meet again on the 17th. So anybody who's here, you come back on the 17th. Yep. Eight at the same time, Thursday at 8 o'clock on Eastern Standard Time. We can talk about, you can type in or you can pop in and say what you did. If you if you did something, I'd love to hear a little report. And I will do something too, and I will report. And um, and I think that it's it's important to, to cultivate good uh, random acts of kindness and good deeds and, and also just to generate gratitude in our own lives. Because I think it, it is these acts of kindness, acts of service that, um, that harvest and nurture this kind of this kind of mm-hmm. that we need we need more of it and we need more people um, instead of focusing on the plethora of bad things in the world there's plenty to focus on for that but yep. there's also you can generate goodness too it's it's just a matter of can you decide to be um you know, I, my thing is spark my muse and my motto on the thing is be the spark of love and light that you want to see in the world. If you want that in the world, you be mm-hmm. the spark, you be that. And so then exactly. if you want that there, go for it, do it. <laughs> you know, nobody's going to do it but you. So you have the chance. And so I think that that's kind of like, if you want to say, you know, hey, where's God in this? Okay, you get your chance. Like you're, yeah. you're the you're the incarnation of God's hands and feet, and so you get your chance. And so, um, so that's it's not always easy, and you might not be. You know, my my husband's in the hospital right now, so my my head's distracted, and I'm in another place worrying about him. But it doesn't mean I can't be kind, and it doesn't mean I can't mm-hmm. be for others. And so we all get our chance to to try, and we'll screw it up, and we'll be mean sometimes, but hopefully we can cultivate these practices and generate gratitude. People have gratitude towards us, and we can and it'll mm-hmm. go back and forth. And I hope I haven't been keeping track of the time, so I'm not. Sure. Yeah, we we probably. I was gonna say when you're done with that, maybe we wanna uh, come in with our closing, and uh, not that this isn't keep going, but. <laughs> But yeah, if, if uh, we probably want to go into kind of closing remarks and yeah, but 
but it's been great. Thank you all for coming, guys. And, and mm -hmm. this has been really fun. Hopefully, Chris, I, I think I can commit to at least twice a month. Um, and I think we'll be, I'll be also partnering with another with James Prescott to do another blab a month. So I don't want to get too Excellent. carried away. And right. Be, be blab <laughs> blab my kids will be like, hey, what about us? Um, but this, is, this is always fun to, to chat with you and to, uh, to talk about the, uh, the big questions and the important things in life. Yep, and, and I totally agree, and, and I look forward to the uh, twice a month. And uh, I'll have to listen to your other blab with uh, uh, Prescott and, uh, you know, look at all of that but uh yeah i appreciate everybody who's here you know if you really enjoy what we're talking about uh you know definitely encourage you to join in but definitely share the word with uh you know your social networks and uh you know the more people we can get in here the more sharing the more learning and for me that's what it's all about you know i, I learn a lot from what you're saying lisa and you know when, when people join in uh you know we can learn from each other and, and again that's that community you know it's, it's kind of our our lab computer community uh but we can learn from each other and, and maybe even spread some of that gratitude to each other and uh so yeah this this has been great i, I really appreciate it yeah, um, yeah. all right yeah and, and whoever's still tuning in you don't have to be afraid about popping in for a blab if you're in your pajamas or something you can you can dress up and and uh, comb your hair for the next time pop in and say what you what you did for your random act of kindness Exactly. We'll, we'll be looking forward to that. And uh, yeah, feel free to send those on uh, our sites and, and our Twitter feeds. And, and let's hear what people have been doing for their uh, random act of kindness. <laughs> All right. Well, good night, Chris. Good night, everyone. All right. Good night. Bye, everyone.